Hello YouTube, and welcome to the DBTO Show, episode 210. Now, back in the late 90s and the very early 2000s, there were three games consoles on the market. The Sony PlayStation, the Sega Saturn, and the Nintendo 64. Now, there was a big debate about whether certain platforms could do certain games. And one certain game franchise, which was very popular because of a lot of reasons, was Tomb Raider. Now, this is the anniversary trilogy pack on the PS3, but it's the only prop I have. The original Tomb Raider was very popular back in the 90s. And the Sega Saturn got a port, and it was a... It was a, it was a good port. But the Nintendo 64 never got a Tomb Raider game. And people were saying, well, the Nintendo 64 can't do that sort of gameplay because limited cartridge space. I have two words for that. Bull shit. The Nintendo 64 could do those sort of um, games. The only issue was it was expensive and difficult. So you needed a development team with plenty of money and plenty of time in order to produce a game like this. And that leads me on to the subject of today's review. Today, I am giving you a double review. This review will be India Jones and the Infernal Machine for the Game Boy Color, which is not often talked about on the internet. And also, India Jones and the Infernal Machine on the Nintendo 64. Now, let's see how good these games are. Do they belong in a museum? where they can be um, appreciated and enjoyed? Or do they belong lost in a tomb, lost to time, where only random rumours will be talked about? Let's find out. Okay, let's begin with the story for India Jones and the Infernal Machine. I'm going to start with the Game Boy Color version. But the story is exactly the same, regardless of which version of the game you play. You are India Jones, and the Russians are trying to find parts of a ancient death machine created by the Babylons. So, you've got the, a very basic story. Find the um, parts of the um, ancient doomsday device before the Russians do, before they take over the world, and try and do what the Germans did in the 1940s. Originally the story apparently was going to involve aliens, but that idea was taken by George Lucas because eventually he did want to create Crystal Skull, which was a dumb idea because Crystal Skull sucks. There are three in the Joe's movies, and that's it. We don't talk about Crystal Skull. Okay, let's go on to the graphics for the Game Boy Color version. The graphics of the Game Boy Color version, considering what the Game Boy Color is capable of, I think they're pretty impressive. It's an isometric 3D platformer. My only problem with the graphics was sometimes certain objects or parts of the background might blend into the background. Example, in the first level, there's an area where you have to swing along with your whip and there's these pegs in the wall. If you're not standing in the right place and you press your whip button, it Indy won't swing and you can't always see these pegs and it's a little bit tricky and sometimes it's a little bit... Yeah, it's just general isometric stuff. Sometimes you can't always tell what's background, what's foreground. It's just a little bit tricky. but. Considering what the Game Boy Color is capable of, it's pretty good. Next, let's move on to controls. The controls for the Game Boy Color version, very simple. D-pad moves. A button does 
a lot of things. I'll go back to the A button later. Beeb unsurprisingly jumps, which I'm not a fan of because I prefer when A's jump because I'm a Mario person, you know. A is jump. But you deal with what you got to deal with. Going back to the A button. The A button using items and confirming and all that sort of stuff. And I, I also think it's for your revolver. And if you press the select button, you can cycle through some of your commands, which is a lot easier than going to the start menu, which lets you um, select things manually, kind of like a Resident Evil. You can also, well, going on to the start menu. The start menu is just a simple menu. You, all your um, quest items are there, your Wii weapons and your treasures. So overall, controls are simple but good, but I wish the um, jumping was A rather than B. Next, let's go to the music. The music for the Game Boy Color version is almost non-existent, which is a big shame because the Game Boy Color is capable of some nice 8-bit chip music. If you, As soon as you start the game up, you get a nice 8-bit rendition of the Indiana Jones theme, which is pretty much the only song you hear, and that's the only place you hear it. Everything else is ambient sound effects, kind of like in the Tomb Raider games and animal sound effects and that sort of thing and gunshots so yeah the Game Boy Coalition does not have much in the music department gameplay it's pretty good apart from the isometric perspective being a little bit confusing it's pretty good at times when I was playing the game I found swimming a little bit difficult because it's it looks like it's three dimensional but it's actually only two dimensions and when you're swimming and you want to grab something underwater you have to press the A button in the right spot in order to grab what you want to grab and it's just a little bit tricky. I remember one level where I had to use a spanner or a hammer to and it, it took me a while to figure out where to um, press the A button in order to actually get said propeller and continue the level. But it was quite an interesting puzzle. I do like that there's a nice variety of levels here. The, the game doesn't seem to get boring with its background, that's for sure, and settings. Let's move on to the good stuff about the Game Boy Color version. Gameplay is pretty good. Cutscenes? They're mostly um, static images and um, text boxes, which is what most Game Boy Color games do. You won't see any voice acting, which, which you don't really expect the Game Boy Color because they ain't got out much memory space. But overall, considering what the Game Boy Color can do, it's good. Another thing I liked about the game was the puzzles. Throughout the game, there'll be Switch puzzles and sort of Metroidvania puzzles where you have to find an item and take it to a certain spot in order to open a door and then find another item and take it to another spot to open a door. The puzzles are users, your are good. Whip, grabbing items and throughout the game you get um, collectibles and these collectibles can be used to unlock an extra level at the end of the game. If you collect enough collectibles you'll raise in these IQ points. I don't know how collecting some sort of weird clay doll object or a, a diamond or a rupee raises your IQ points, but yay, video gaming logic! Because that makes perfect sense. But yeah, if you manage to collect enough of these gems, you'll unlock an extra level at the end of the game. The game does not have a battery backup save. It actually has a password save, which was quite common back then. It um, cheapened the development cost for um, developers. And the password system, well, there's two ways you can use it. Way number one, you can just play through the game normally and collect your passwords. Or what I prefer to do is get the passwords from the internet and use those ones. Because if you use those ones, you'll get a, a few more med packs and a few more poison kits. And it also just, just works better for me. Also, at the end of every level, this is one thing I found a little bit surprising. There's actually a shop. Throughout the game, you can collect money and spend it on items and stuff like that. You can, you can buy more med kits and poison kits. And that's my good stuff for the Game Boy Color version. Let's talk about the Nintendo 64 version. The Nintendo 64 version, the story is exactly the same as the Game Boy Color version, but way better presented. It actually has fully voice actor uh, cutscenes, which took by surprise kind of like voice acting on the Nintendo 64. That's um, very impressive. Only a few games did that. Example, Conker's Bad Fur Day and a little bit of Hybrid Heaven. So the fact that they went to the effort and put Looks like this place a voice acting in, it impressed me. The story bits. It is a shame that Harrison Ford does not reprise his role as India Jones, but I think they chose another guy to do it because if they chose Harrison Ford, the developer cost of this game would be a lot of money and I'm not so sure if the game would have been able to come out because paying a guy like Harrison Ford to 
voice acting in a video game would probably cost a lot of money. Yeah, the voice acting is good. It's, there is one weird thing when you're watching the story cut scenes. The characters talk mm. without moving their lips. It looks like a lot of the games at the time, so it is a little bit uncanny, a little bit weird, but the fact they got voice acting in the first place is still impressive, uh -huh. even though the character's lips don't move. Next, let's I'm go on to the controls for the Nintendo 64 version. I'm going to talk about the PC version just a little bit here. When I played the PC version back when I was a kid, I wasn't really accustomed to using mouse and keyboard. I liked having a controller in my hand. And I wasn't really accustomed to hotkeys and all this PC gamer terms. And I couldn't really play the PC version. It took me a while to find where the jump key was and how to move and, and, and shoot. It was just really difficult. Yes, I had the instruction manual at the time. It was just, I just remember it being really difficult and I'm putting the uh, PC version down pretty quickly. Overall, the N64 controls, it controls like an old Tomb Raider game. So if you've played the old Tomb Raider games, like w Tomb Raider 1, 2 and 3 on the PlayStation, you'll know what this game controls like. But one of the best things that the developers did, they took one look at Ocarina of Time and thought, hmm, I got it. Let's have um, the ability to assign buttons to certain items and just make the game a lot better. And that's exactly what they did. Literally, you can assign three items to the C buttons and you'll just be able to select them on command and then use them with your B button. A button is jump. The only thing about jumping that I had a problem with there's you have plenty of forward momentum jumping but when it comes to jumping straight up, that can be a little bit more tricky. The camera controls, there really aren't any. You can press the R button, centre the camera behind you, which does help, but that's your literally your only option. And the L button puts weapons away, or the item that you're using at the current time. The D-pad isn't used at, at all. And then you've got the Z button, which locks in the into strafe mode, so you can strafe, which is... Quite useful. B button grabs and interacts with things. This is really helpful when it comes to solving puzzles like moving blocks and other stuff like that. And this wireframe sort of map is surprisingly absent from the Nintendo 64 version, which, to, to be brutally honest, the D-pad could have been used to um, rotate the camera left and right, and I suppose down on the D-pad could have brought up some sort of map screen. A little bit hard to deal with and I really don't understand why they left it out. Okay, um, but other than that, control's good. When I was watching Let's Plays to get through his game last year, I noticed that the PC version had like a wireframe sort of map. A map was left out of the Nintendo 64 version. Swimming controls can feel a little bit stiff. A button paddles and use the analog stick to orient yourself. And at certain points in the game, you may need to interact with things in the water and you have to be perfectly, and I do mean perfectly, lined up in order to interact with said thing in the water. Otherwise the game's like, no, no. And you may think you're right there, but if you're just one pixel out, it's not gonna work. Now let's go to the graphics for the Nintendo 64 version. At the time, the PC version and the Nintendo 64 version are pretty much identical in terms of graphics. The PC version might have slightly better text and slightly better lighting and, you know, just a few slightly better things, depending on the specs of your PC at, at the time in the um, early 2000, late 90s when this game was released. You can also use the expansion the pack of the Nintendo 64 version which will up the graphics and that sort of thing. But depending on how, depending on which area of the game is, sometimes depending on which mode you're playing in, expansion pack or non-expansion, there may be some frame rate problems, which was quite common with the Nintendo 64. Uh, Banjo Tooie had some frame rate issues as well. But overall, graphics are good and frame rate is pretty solid. Right, let's go on to the music for the Nintendo 64 version and the PC version. It's it's good. They use the Indiana Jones theme throughout the game and it sounds good, it's just nice to hear. The game has voice acting, which I was really impressed by, because not many Nintendo 64 games actually have that. And the rest of the music is mostly ambulant Tomb Raider sort of stuff, and you know, it does its job. Good. Gameplay. It's very similar to the old Tomb Raider games. If you've played the old Tomb Raider games and you enjoyed them, you'll probably enjoy this. One of the things that did annoy me though, throughout the game, one of the most annoying names is 
in both versions was the scorpions. They'll walk up to you and one sting of their stinger, you'll instantly be poisoned. You have to go through your menu and find a poison kit and heal yourself. But other than that, most of the enemies you can just take out your um, gun and shoot them. I mean, best advice when you do with enemies, take out the scorpions first just so that that makes things a lot easier. Good stuff about this game. The good stuff about it um, is cutscenes are fantastic. There's a nice variety of levels. You've got tombs, a level where you have to ride a raft down a river and light, place some candles and light them. This is one of the levels that really could have used that Sophia. map because there's, there's rapids there. and if you go down the wrong rapid you'll be sent right back to the start or to a newer point in the level and it's a map would have just really really helped. But there's a nice variety of locations. Another thing that I really liked hey. is that there's a, a nice variety of weapons. Now, in the Game Boy Color version, you just get an infinite revolver. Which is nice, you know, just re just revolver the shit out of everything. Infinite ammo, no problems. But in the Nintendo 64 version and the PC version, you've got an infinite revolver, which is still nice. If you ever run out of ammo, you just fall back in your revolver. But you've also you got rifles, mean? shotguns, a big bazooka, grenades and handguns, machine pistols, just a nice variety of weapons just to get what you get done what you need to get done. And there's also health kits, poison kits and your healing herbs both in small and big. Another thing I liked about the game were all the different puzzles, it's mostly um, environmental puzzles, kind of like the old Tomb Raider games and pulling switches and all that sort of good stuff. It's, it's good. Good. And there, there are treasures collected throughout the game. Depending on how many treasures you collect, you can also unlock an extra level at the end of the game. And this will, it's, it's just a nice reward to collect all the treasures. There are 10 treasures per level. The Nintendo 64 version also has passwords. If you put in these passwords, you can unlock development shots of the game in development. And you can also unlock the extra level. But if you unlock the password, once you turn up the N64, you have to put the password again in order to unlock it again. Or you can just collect the treasures and unlock them the proper way. There is one more thing I want to add about the controls. The driving sections in the Nintendo 64 version and the PC version are a little bit weird in the way the vehicle accelerates. It doesn't really have like a gradual build up, and if it does, it's barely noticeable. The gradual build up is almost non event non existent. You seem to hit top speed in the Jeep when you're driving it very, very quickly. There's this one level where you have to drive this Jeep over jumps in order to get further in the level. And when I was driving the Jeep, I felt like, oh dear, how much momentum am I going to gain here? You know, how fast this thing is going to go? And it was just a little bit difficult for me to figure out speed because you just get to top speed so fast. There are no driving sections of the Game Boy Color version apart from the raft level. The Nintendo 64 version also has a shop. It's pretty much the same as the Game Boy Color version. You can buy health kits, poison kits, and ammo for all your weapons that you have currently up to that point. Okay, on to my complaints for the Game Boy Color version. Complaint number one, the game has no map, which makes navigation a pain in the ass. Complaint number two, the game in terms of jumping and how the game displays isometric 3D makes jumping difficult. You can only really jump forward with a good distance. When it comes to jumping upwards, your reach and height is limited. And also, finding those little pegs on the wall and using your whip also can be a little bit tricky because it, the game doesn't always like it if you whip in the wrong place. Also, I got lost quite a lot in the game due to the fact that the game has no map. And there was one level which I found a somewhat hilarious but also game-breaking bug. I jumped into a 
wall in one of the later levels because I was trying to line up my jump to progress further I jumped in the wrong direction and accidentally I jumped into a wall and when my character got off the wall I was stuck in the swimming animation and I could literally swim anywhere in the level I wanted even though the level was not underwater I had unlimited oxygen so I could literally swim through this one portion of the level. I have no idea what caused this glitch and how I exactly activated it, but it seems jumping against that particular wall activated swimming in midair so you can go wherever you want. But other than that, the Game Boy Color version is a pretty good game. It's a simple average. Now on to my complaints with the Nintendo 64 version. First things first, no map which is inexcusable because the PC version had a map and there is no reason they could not have put a map in the Nintendo 64 version since they were trying to get as close a port as possible. It would have been pretty easy considering the N64's power just to have the same map that the PC version did and this would have made the game a lot less easy to get lost and a lot more to play. Um, jumping is kind of weird. If, if you're accustomed to the old Tomb Raiders, you know how this works, but if you're not, it will take you a while to adjust to the how the game wants you to play. Jumping can be a problem, it just takes a lot of practice to get things right, and for the love of God, don't forget to hold A so you can grab onto platforms, because that grab will save your life a, a lot, and if you forget to hold A, you'll regret it. I'm not so sure if this is a problem with my cartridge, my Nintendo 64, or just the game in general. Sometimes my game would freeze and I would have to reload my save and reset the console. But other than that, that's the only glitch I found. I didn't find any weirdness of swimming in midair. But that was hilarious with the Game Boy Color version. There was one instance in the game where I got motion sickness. I think it was the last level of the game. There was like this swimming section with blue rippling water and the water texture made me feel a little bit motion sickness and that was it. Okay, let's go on to my ratings for the Game Boy Color port of Indiana Jones The Infernal Machine and the Nintendo 64 version. Overall, I give the Game Boy Color version a 3 out of 5. It's a pretty good game, it's above average. Is it worth buying or worth playing? If you are curious about this game, yeah, track it down. It's relatively cheap days and it can be pretty fun if you're interested in isometric platformers. Now, on to the um, Nintendo 64 version and the PC version. Getting this game is quite difficult for this platform. In America, it was only available at Blockbuster and it's quite expensive, but you can buy this game on eBay for around about 30 pound or whatever they cover that in, in doors these days is. But I got a flash cartridge online and this is a PAL homebrew version and it didn't cost me that much. It was relatively easy to track down. The Nintendo 64 version and the PC version, despite the um, problems, I give it a three and a half out of five. So it's a good adventure game and it proves that the Nintendo 64 could do a Tomb Raider-like game. Anyway, that's my review over. See you guys in my next video. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Bye.